We are live. Hey, how's it going? It is your muscle building coach, Lee Hayward, back again with another live video chat. And today I'll be hanging out here for the next hour. So if there's anything that you would like to discuss with regards to bodybuilding and fitness, workouts, nutrition, any specific challenges that you may be dealing with when it comes to building muscle, losing fat, and all that kind of stuff, please feel free to post those questions and topics of discussion in the video chat window, and I'll do my best to help you out in any way that I can during our video chat today. So we're just getting started here now. Uh, for those of you who are watching live, uh, before I get into answering the questions, I always do this every week. I want to do a quick uh, video and audio check just to make sure that it's coming through loud and clear. It usually does, but I've had some times in the past where it hasn't. So if you can hear me and see me and all that good stuff, please let me know in the video chat comments that you can actually hear me, see me. And uh, when you do that, then you can go ahead and post your questions for discussion and we'll get started with our live video chat. So I just got a couple things to organize here from my end before we get going. All right, just get a, open up a new window for our video chat discussion. I got the wrong window open. Just bear with me, guys. Just getting things organized here from my end. Sometimes the computer can be a bit uh, crooked as it doesn't want to respond always. I'm trying to open up a new window and it's not working for me. All right, let's try that again. <laughs> okay, I think we're good. Excellent. All right, we got some questions coming through here. Ken is joining us saying that things are coming through loud and clear. Thank you for that. I do appreciate it. All right, let's jump into this. Shoot. My computer's acting really weird. I think I might need to reboot it, but I'm not going to. I'm going to try and make it work. Sometimes I'm, when I'm clicking the mouse, things are just popping up the way they shouldn't. All right, there we go. All right, Ken's got a question saying, uh, what would you suggest for somebody with much larger legs and hips compared to shoulders and arms? He says, I hesitate to train legs because of that, but I know neglecting them is unwise. Okay, that's a, a good question. And, you know, you're, you're going to have different people who have certain strengths. I mean, more often than not, <laughs> a lot of guys will probably have their legs being a lagging body part because a lot of guys just don't like to train legs. But if your legs are even more developed than your upper body, then all you have to do is prioritize your upper body workouts. And I was like this when I started training. Uh, back in my early days of, of bodybuilding, my legs were much more developed compared to my upper body. Uh, and it had a lot to do with the, the hobbies and activities that I did a, as a child growing up and even before I got into serious weight training. Uh, one, I was a huge fan of uh, BMX biking. So, I mean, I did a lot of exercise for the legs through cycling, biking. And I was also involved with martial arts. So doing a lot of stretching, uh, a lot of kicking drills, a lot of the different stances that you do in martial arts, like holding the horse stance and things like that, really helped to enhance my leg development. So when I look at my early pictures of like my first bodybuilding competition, for example, my legs were huge compared to my arms and upper body. So what I did to help correct that is I basically increased the frequency of my upper body workouts and I cut back on the frequency of the lower body workouts. Now, there's different ways to go about that, how, how you want to structure it, because, you know, you got all kinds of different workout programs. But a general rule of thumb, hit all your upper body muscles twice as often as you hit your lower body muscles. Uh, if, if you want, you could probably even scale it back further than that. But that's a good place to start. So two upper body workouts for every lower body workout. And this will help to... Uh, basically give extra muscle stimulation for your upper body, but you're not neglecting the legs in the process. Uh, so that's what I would recommend for someone in your situation where your, your legs are overpowering your upper body. 
Uh, Sean is joining us from Australia, seeing everything's coming through loud and clear. Thank you, Sean. I, I'm not sure the, the time zone difference. It's probably very late in Australia or very early, one, one, one or the other. I'm not. <laughs> but again, thanks for tuning in. Uh, we have Instar, in, Intar, <laughs> in, Intar Alley saying whole food multivitamins versus synthetic multivitamins. Um, okay, I would recommend trying to meet the majority of your nutritional requirements as far as, I mean, th this not just for vitamins, but I mean, protein, carbohydrates, fat, all that stuff. Try to get the bulk of it through natural, unprocessed foods. Uh, look at vitamins as basically just kind of like an insurance policy. It's just like a little extra you know, to, to make sure that you're actually covering all bases. Because unfortunately, the quality of our food these days is not the same as it used to be generations ago. I mean, when we have mass produced foods, uh, the way commercial farming is, uh, it's the foods are not as nu nutrient dense as they used to be. Uh, so you kind of just have to take the Take that with a grain of salt. I mean, obviously, you're still going to try and consume as much of the good, wholesome foods as you can, but realize that they may not be covering all the vitamin and mineral needs that you need. So that's where the vitamin supplements can come into play. Now, as far as the types of supplements, uh, what I would recommend that you do is, is basically, if, if you have a particular brand that you're interested in, go online and do some research on that particular brand read some reviews on it, try and do as much research as you can, and do a broad scope research. Like just don't read one website that probably has a positive review about something and think, well, maybe this, then it must be good. Research a lot of websites and, and also check out forums and, and other areas for discussion that may be talking about particular supplements that you may be interested in using because it's good to get a wide spectrum of opinions and then you kind of base your decision on the general, you know, the general majority decision on whether something is good to use or not. Like don't just take one website or, or one article or something like that and use that as your opinion. Try and get a, a well-rounded uh, gathering of research. Uh, you know, when I say research, I mean Google research <laughs> of your own and to get a, to form an opinion on what supplements to use. You can also ask around at your local gym, uh, ask other people who, who whose opinion you trust, uh, what supplements they're using, and kind of make your decisions that way as well. But again, try and get the majority of your nutritional intake through whole foods whenever possible, and then just use the supplements as that, a supplement to your whole food diet to make sure that you are covering all bases. We have Raiders joining us. He says, Lee, do you track how much you weigh, uh, sorry, do you track how much you, how much weight <laughs> you lift workout to workout? Sorry. I'm getting tongue tied here. I had a busy day, guys. I had a busy day. So I'm just bear with me. I'm trying to get the coffee in me to <laughs> get things settled away. Do I track how much weight I lift workout to workout? Yes, I, I usually do. I like to keep a training log. I don't have my gym bag on me right now, but I, I actually made a video not too long ago talking about the importance of a training log and keeping track of your workouts. So keep track of the body parts you train, the exercises you do, the, the weight sets and reps that you perform, and just keep a log of that. And what I like to do is when I go back to doing a particular workout or a particular exercise, I like to judge my performance based on what I did for my previous workout. So it's what I strive to do is either get an extra repetition uh, on a you know on a set, add an extra five pounds to the exercise, or some form of gradual progression as often as possible. Now, of course, that doesn't always happen. When you're newer to lifting, uh, it's going to happen more frequently. When you're older and more advanced and kind of like pushing the, 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 the limits of your natural genetic potential, then obviously you're not going to make the same degree of muscle gains as someone who's just starting out. But I do like to keep track of my workouts and it just gives you that feedback to know where you are. Like, are you actually moving forwards? Are you gaining strength? Are you losing strength? And if I do find that I'm either gaining or losing strength, I also like to make a little note 
uh, you know, as in, in my training log as to why I may be gaining or losing strength. For example, if I've been really consistent with my workouts, really consistent with my nutrition, and I just know things are on track, well, that's a good sign that you should be moving forwards. Uh, sometimes if I find that I'm actually losing strength, it might not necessarily be due to muscular strength. It may be my joints might be feeling tired or sore. Like if, if you're trying to do an exercise and your shoulders are bothering you or your elbows are bothering you, uh, that's going to prevent how much weight you can lift with those exercises that require those those joints. I mean, if, if you're doing legs and your knees are sore, you're not going to be able to push yourself and lift as heavy. So it may not necessarily mean that you're losing muscle if you can't uh, duplicate the same strength that you did in a previous workout, but you just want to kind of uh, evaluate your training and kind of keep on, keep on top of it to know how your body's responding, and then you can adjust your workouts accordingly. Right. I mean, if I am experiencing that joint pain and soreness, then I may have to either choose different exercises that don't place the same strain on those joints. Uh, I may have to lighten up the workload, you know, do a lighter weights, higher reps or some sort of manipulation in order to try and work around the pain as best I can. And uh, but again, it's definitely a good idea to keep track of your training for sure. I mean, otherwise, you're just kind of winging it. You know, you're going into the gym and you don't know, you know, what's working from day to day. And uh, I'm not saying that you can't make progress by doing that. I mean, anything that you do consistently is still going to help make progress. I mean, anything is better than nothing. But if you want to optimize your progress, then you definitely need to track it and uh, keep accurate tabs on your workouts. Daniel is joining us. And he says, Lee, I just started going back to the gym. It's been really difficult to stay consistent. My question is, should I start my diet immediately or start it when the gym schedule is a sexy routine. <laughs> I've never had a sexy routine at the gym. <laughs> uh, what I would recommend, uh, if, first off, with your workouts, don't overcomplicate them when you're starting out. W one of the biggest mistakes that a lot of people who are new to the gym or coming back to the gym after a layoff, one of the biggest mistakes that they make is they try and do too much too soon they overcomplicate things and they basically burn themselves out in the process. I mean, if, if you're coming back to the gym either as a brand new person or after a long layoff, a 30 minute workout is more than enough. 30 minutes tops. You don't need to be in there any longer than that. And just go through the motions. Just get into the habit of going to the gym consistently. I really don't care what you do when you get there as long as you show up. The hardest part is showing up get consistent at that. I mean, try and uh, book a schedule with yourself, maybe like every other day or something like that, where you're going to show up to the gym at a certain time and just be consistent with it. Make that a habit and uh, like an appointment that you can't break. You know? So you're going to show up, say three or four days a week, boom, I'm going to show up to the gym and do my thing. Uh, as far as the workout, keep it simple. Uh, I've got a beginner's total body workout posted on the Total Fitness Bodybuilding YouTube channel. That's a great one that I recommend a lot of people to start with. But uh, if you have a particular workout that you want to follow, that's fine as well. But don't push yourself too hard. Like don't go doing multiple sets, training to failure, and, and really pushing yourself with a lot of intensity. Just kind of coast through the workouts for the first month back. Uh, do that because you don't want to burn yourself out and risk getting injured. And second, uh, you don't need to place a lot of excess strain on the body because if you do too much, you're going to create soreness, you're going to create pain and aggravation, and it's going to be harder to be consistent. It's a lot harder to go to the gym when your body is aching because you pushed it too hard, and did too much too soon. It's better to just do a little bit, recover from that, and then go to the gym consistently and do, and do a little bit more and then recover from that and go to the gym again and gradually build it up uh, week by week rather than going in there all full of piss and vinegar and trying to go gung-ho right off the get-go and end up you know, making yourself excessively sore or worse, pulling or straining something and getting injured in the process. So just take it easy with the workouts. Make it just a, a fun little quick 30-minute workout in and out of the gym. And do it consistently. As far as your diet, you don't need to get on some strict diet plan, but focus on cleaning it up. I mean, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out what foods you should be eating or what foods you shouldn't be eating. I mean, just look at the typical foods you're eating and think, is this helping me with my fitness goals or is this hindering me? I mean, if it's a piece of chocolate cake, is that helping you achieve your fitness goals? Probably not. 
Is it hindering you? Probably, yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, you can just use that simple thing. Just think, is this moving me forwards or is this holding me back? And, and make good food choices. Just natural, unprocessed foods. Minimize the junk food. Uh, don't get too hung up on, you know, counting your calories or counting your macros or anything like that. Just try and make good, healthy food choices, minimizing or avoiding the junk food. Uh, as far as your, your drinks are concerned, like fluids, minimize sodas and juices and, and sports drinks and all that and trying to stick to pure water. Or if you want to have something else, have, say, like black coffee or green tea. But try and minimize, you know, all the, the processed and the calorie-containing drinks like soda and juice. Uh, sports drinks are another big one. I mean, I know a lot of people think sports drinks are, you know, good for you or whatever. But it's basically just sugar water. So, I mean, sports drinks are... Uh, unless you are like an extreme athlete who needed something like that, you know, sports drinks are, are a waste of money and it's basically just going to cause you to gain excess body fat. So things like Gatorade and Powerade and whatever aid is out there, don't even bother with it. Just stick to plain water as your drink of choice uh, and, and keep it simple. You know, just don't overcomplicate things. Just master the basics. Keep it simple and you'll be surprised at the progress you can make by doing the basics day in, day out, week in, week out year in, year out, so on. You can make a lot of progress by keeping it simple and just moving yourself forward like that. Speaking of water and drinks, I'm going to have some water. Okay, we've got... What else question? Uh, Raiders asking, do you think 10 to 20 repetitions is good for muscle building? Uh, the, the number of repetitions you do really depends on the program you're following, the exercise you're doing. But bottom line, you can make progress in all different rep ranges. You know, there, there are advantages to all the different rep ranges. Uh, for, generally, for most muscle building exercises, you're going to be probably in that, I would say, 8 to 12 repetition range for most. Uh, some of the bigger, heavier compound exercises, you may go a bit lower. Uh, some of the isolation exercises, you may go a bit higher. But for most moves, you're going to be in the 8 to 12 repetition range. Uh, but again, you can make progress with all rep ranges, right? So, I mean, like, for example, you could do a 5 by 5 program and make progress. Uh, you could do, you know, uh, something like the 20 rep squat routine and then make progress. So don't go getting hung up on, on the repetitions. What's most important is actually progressive overload. So either increasing the weight that you're lifting for those repetitions or using the same weight and performing more repetitions. So, I mean, some form of progressive overload. And then you can also look into other variables like increasing the total volume of sets that you do, maybe decreasing the rest time between sets. I mean, there's a lot of ways that you can implement progressive overload into a training program. But the main ones that uh, we tend to focus on is uh, weight and the repetitions performed. So you can definitely look into that. But again, there's advantages to all the different rep ranges. Vivid Joey's got a question saying, can I replace, excuse me, <laughs> let me start that one again. Uh, Vivid Joey's asking, can I replace bench presses with dumbbell presses even after a couple of years, the bench press doesn't agree with my shoulders and I don't feel it in my chest like I do with dumbbells? Absolutely. There's no rule in bodybuilding that thou must bench press. If you don't like bench presses, it doesn't activate your chest the way you want to or whatever, you can do another exercise instead. And dumbbell bench presses are a, phen a phenomenal exercise for working the chest. And the thing that I like about the dumbbell bench press is it has more freedom of movement with your hand positions. You're not locked into that rigid grip that you are with a barbell. With the, the dumbbell, you can rotate your wrists. So, I mean, if you find it's hard on the shoulders, a little tip, rotate your wrists so that your hands are at a 45 degree angle when you're pressing those dumbbells. That takes the rotation off the shoulder, places more of the workload on the chest and as well as the triceps, and chances are it'll be a more comfortable pressing variation, and you should be able to get more muscle activation in the chest with less strain on the shoulders. So yeah, if, if you don't like bench presses, you don't have to do it. And that applies with all exercises. The same thing with squats. If for some reason squats don't agree with you, then you don't have to squat. If deadlifts don't agree with you, you don't have to deadlift. I mean, a lot of people think that you have to do these, you know, the three power lifts, you know, the bench, squat, and deadlift. But 
everybody is different. So, I mean, if, if for some reason they don't agree with you, you don't have to do it, right? You can do other exercises instead. The most important thing is working the muscle, not doing the exercise. As long as you're training the, the muscles and doing so in a progressive overload fashion, you can still make progress. Okay, next we have the official Moses Escobar, and he's saying, Lee, I'm having trouble joining the Inner Circle Club. Is there any way you can help me? Uh, yes, just send me a, an email personally, and I will walk you through whatever technical issues you may be having with that. Uh, if you want, you can email me at leeh at leehayward.com, and I will take care of that. Uh, and second part of his question, is there any any way, uh, so, sorry, uh, second part is, also, my right tricep cramps every time I do extension movements. Why is that? It's nearly above the elbow. Okay, triceps are cramping. There's, there's several reasons why you may have muscle cramps. It could be an electrolyte imbalance. It could be not warming up properly before doing a particular movement. Um, you know, tr there, there's, I really need to know more about it, but just kind of cover some basic tips that you can try. Uh, one, make sure that you are well hydrated and that you have adequate electrolytes in your system before you work out. And the easiest way to do that is to simply add salt to your food. I mean, you can purposely take salt before your workouts, but like in, in the meals leading up to your workout, purposely add some table salt to your food, and this will help to ensure that you have extra sodium in your system, and this will help to prevent muscle cramps. Sodium is like the underrated nutrient out there. I mean, a lot of people think sodium is bad, so they purposely go out of their way to avoid it, but for hard training athletes and fitness enthusiasts, people who are drinking lots of water, who are sweating on a regular basis through exercise and, and workouts, you need to replenish the sodium that you lose. So if, if you're not replenishing it, then you can go into an electrolyte deficit. And that's why a lot of people end up with cramps and things like that is because they're literally, they don't have uh, adequate electrolytes in their system. So uh, simply salting your food can go a long way. And in addition to that, eating a lot of natural unprocessed foods that have good sources of uh, potassium and magnesium and all these other electrolytes as well. Uh, another thing that I would recommend with... Uh, um, your whole tricep issue, start off with multiple light warm-up sets. So whatever exercises you're doing for your triceps, start off with multiple light warm-up sets to really try and get the blood pumping into the muscles before you attempt heavy weight. Uh, if you try and do a, a heavy weight when your muscle is, is not fully warmed up, uh, that can cause issues in terms of cramping and, and just strain in the muscle. So make sure to take your time and do a proper warm up, and that should help a lot as well. And if if that doesn't help, then you can probably even look into doing different exercises. I mean, maybe certain movements that you're doing are just cause just doesn't work well for your body. I mean, it just doesn't you know for whatever reason it just doesn't agree with you. So maybe you can try some different uh, exercises instead. Maybe experiment with different push down variations or you know different. Uh, you know, machine exercise variations or dumbbell exercises or whatever that you have available at your gym. You know, if a particular exercise doesn't work or hurts, causes any discomfort, try something else. I mean, there's no rule that's saying that you have to do a certain exercise. Like I mentioned before, the main thing is that you're just working the muscle. Don't get uh, attached to the particular exercise. Wood Yulos is joining us from Scotland, and he says, do you have any good stretches for tight hip flexors? Sitting at a desk all day long is killing me. Uh, yes, I do. I actually have a lot of, of stretching videos. Well, maybe, you know, half a dozen or more, <laughs> if you consider that a lot. But I do have a, a stretching video playlist uh, up on the main Total Fitness Bodybuilding YouTube channel. And some of those stretching videos cover specific stretches for the legs, as well as there is also a hip mobility stretching routine that you can do as well. And that's going to cover some specific exercises for the hip flexors. So I would recommend that you do that. Uh, if, if you want to just search for it directly, type in Lee Hayward hip mobility and you should find that particular video covering the, the hip mobility stretches and exercise routine. Another thing that I would recommend is yoga. 
regularly doing yoga is going to help with not just your, your hip flexors, but all, all your body parts. I mean, it's going to help to increase flexibility and mobility throughout your entire body. And what I like to do is I'll follow yoga videos on YouTube and I'll do it at home in my spare time. So like on my off days from the gym or whatever, I'll go down in my rec room, roll out my yoga mat, I put YouTube up on the big screen TV and I follow along with uh, the, the yoga tutorial right there on YouTube. I mean, you do a search for yoga videos on YouTube and there's like multiple, like hundreds of full length workouts that you can follow along with. So it's almost like having your own private yoga instructor right there in your living room with you. And the cool thing about watching it on video is you can pause and you can replay and, and you know, if you have trouble or whatever, you can replay that thing as many times as you need to until you get it right. Uh, so that's what I like to do, follow along with uh, yoga videos. And I like to vary them. So, I mean, I, I like the idea of each time I go down and do it, I want to do a different yoga video because I find that um, a lot of the stretches are obviously going to be repetitive because, I mean, there, there's some core yoga stretches that you will do from workout to workout. But some of them are going to be different and unique. And I like that that variety. And I find that sometimes when we're getting into some of these different unique uh, stretches and poses and things like that, it really works an area that I know I have not focused on. So, I mean, I might be really strong in one pose and then I'll switch my technique and try something else. And I'm like, whoa, almost toppling over, struggling just to hold myself up. And uh, it, that brings out weaknesses in your body. So, I mean, by doing that, it just helps to strengthen your overall body as a, as a whole. And it also helps to improve flexibility and mobility and all these different tight areas that you probably normally would never, ever focus on. So I'm a big fan of including yoga in addition to your weight training workouts. It's, it's a good complementary balance. It's like weight training is like that hardcore high intensity exercise and yoga is this gentle active recovery exercise. So I mean, it's, it's nice to have that balance, almost like a yin and yang balance where when you combine both of them together, it's very complementary and it can help to improve your overall health and fitness. So if, if you are suffering from any type of you know, tension, you know, mobility issues, stuff like that, then that's a sign that, you know what, you really need to start practicing yoga and doing stuff like that on a regular basis. Okie dokie, let's move on. All right, we've got... Uh, Pinkish <laughs> said, is carb cycling the best approach for fat loss? I want to lose 20 kilograms. How should I approach my journey? Well, carb cycling is one approach, but as far as the best approach, you know, you, you, there, there's a lot of good approaches. And I don't like to say that one is better than the other uh, because there's a lot of variables that come into play. I mean, you talk to some people, they'll say, well, a ketogenic diet is the best. Or some people say, well, intermittent fasting is the best. And other people are going to say, well, you know, carb cycling is the best. Or someone else will probably say a vegan diet is the best or whatever. You're going to hear all kinds of different opinions as to what is the best. Bottom line is you need to find what's the best for you. <laughs> That's the best one. Not what works well for somebody else is what works the best for you. Uh, how I recommend someone approach fat loss in general is to start off very gradual and progressive. Uh, a, a tip that I recommend for a lot of people is when you're trying to lose weight, lose fat specifically, try and diet on as high of a calorie intake as you can while still burning body fat. And the reason why I recommend that is because it's going to help to keep your metabolic rate high. It's going to help to maintain lean muscle. It's going to be much more enjoyable and sustainable to do it this way. And it's going to allow you to train harder in the gym so that you can actually uh, increase your metabolism through building muscle and, and through activity. Because if, if you take the approach of trying to crash diet where you just lower your calories right off the bat and try and diet on as low a calories as you can and starve the weight, uh, what's going to happen is your energy is going to go through the toilet. You're not going to have any energy. Your metabolism is going to slow down. Your uh, strength in the gym is going to plummet. So, I mean, everything just starts, you, you just feel like crap when you're on a low calorie diet. Whereas if you can try and diet on as high a calories as you can while still being in a slight deficit 
and, and just kind of tipping the scale in favor of fat loss, that makes the process so much easier. I mean, nobody likes to, to like starve themselves and go hungry, but you can withstand just a slight deficit, you know, where you just kind of stop your meals just shy of being full. Like instead of eating until you're stuffed, just stop when you're say like 80% full. I mean, you're still satisfied. You still got enough food in your system to function and, and curb your appetite and all that, but not so much that you're actually overeating. So, I mean, little things like just cutting back on your portion sizes, cleaning up your food choices, uh, bumping up your daily cardio, trying to get outside and go for a walk every day if you can. Little things like that will move you in the right direction. And as simple as it sounds, I mean, some people think it's too simple and, and they don't want to do it because they're looking for some big advanced, you know, let me count my macros and get some very scientific, sophisticated fat loss cutting routine with everything mapped out, blah, blah, blah. When you just need to focus on a few little basic key elements to move yourself in the right direction. And if you do that consistently, you'll be surprised by actually how much progress you can make. And the only time you need to make it more complicated is once you start to plateau with the basics. So if you do the simple things like cutting out processed foods, eating all natural foods, um, you know, cutting back on your portion sizes a little bit and increasing your cardio and you do all that kind of basic stuff, just start off with a few little fundamental things and make those a habit that you do day after day after day, you're going to move yourself in the right direction. I mean, you might be able to get, you know, six weeks or more of good steady fat loss just from those few simple changes and then it'll probably start to slow down then when it slows down you can look into doing some more advanced things and that's where you can probably look into a, maybe a carb cycle diet or maybe even try and experimenting with intermittent fasting or, or something along those lines i mean you can use these more advanced strategies after you've plateaued with the basics so that's what i would look at carb cycling as it's a more advanced strategy that you can implement but I wouldn't recommend people to start with it. Start with the basics first, get consistent, and then you can implement those things as your progress stalls once you've already kind of mastered the basics. Now, if this is something that you would like help with, uh, you can just kind of send me a private message and I can you know, discuss this with you in person because this is something that I really uh, focus on is helping people with their nutrition programs. So if you would like some one-on-one -on -one help with designing a optimal fat loss program where we literally start from the basics and then build it in a progressive fashion based on your progress, then just shoot me a private message or you can visit my website at leehayward.com and uh, message me through there as well. All right, Denise is joining us and she says, I have no energy when I'm working out. I eat before I go to the gym. I eat protein and little carbs, no red meat or pork. All right, no energy when you're working out and you do eat before you're going to the gym. Uh, have you tried not eating before you go to the gym? <laughs> That's something that you might want to look into as well. Uh, eating doesn't always guarantee that you're going to have more energy. Sometimes people feel sluggish and actually have less energy after eating. And they may feel that they are feel more um, loose and limber and agile on an empty stomach. Personally, I like to work out on an empty stomach. Uh, I've I've tried different strategies over the years, you know, eating before the gym, eating like an hour before and, and all the, you know, two hours before and blah, blah, blah. Uh, I, I actually find that I have a lot of energy if I work out in a fasted state. If I, I just find that I feel very uh, light and mobile and limber and I don't have that food in my belly slowing me down. Because what happens is when you eat food, your body has to go and digest that food. And that's literally energy that's being taken away from your potential workout energy. So, uh, you know, some people find that eating does help, right? I, I've, I've talked to different people. I mean, some people do find that they can't work out on an empty stomach for whatever reason. They just find it uncomfortable or they don't feel they have, you know, anything to run on. They feel like they're running on empty. Uh, other people find that it works really well for them. Now, Personally, I do like the empty stomach workouts. I find that it works well. Uh, if I'm going to have anything, I might have like a, a cup of coffee beforehand uh, to just give me that little bit of a, a caffeine pick-me-up, and I find that works really well. Uh, you could probably even experiment with, uh, you know, pre-workout supplements. I mean, there's a lot of them out there, and I'm a kind of a bit leery when it comes to pre-workouts because a lot of them are overkill. Uh, meaning that they put too much into them, meaning too much caffeine and too many stimulants and stuff like that in it. And 
while it can work really well initially, it can also, you know, lead to kind of like adrenal fatigue and burn you out. So, I mean, you might get a few weeks of really good workouts and then it's kind of like the, the effects kind of die off. And then it gets to the point where you almost like just need the workout, the pre-workout supplement in order to get back up to like a, a baseline again. So it's not really enhancing your energy at that point. It's just kind of like just that's your new maintenance. Uh, so if you are going to use anything like that, just be cautious about it. Try and be as conservative as you can. Uh, again, for me, I, I find that a, a simple cup of coffee before I go to the gym is is just the right amount of caffeine to give me that little bit of a an edge, a little bit of a mental sharpness, as well as a little bit of physical energy uh, without causing any negative side effects. So those are some suggestions that I would recommend. Uh, another thing that you can look into as well is the time of day that you train. I mean, if you're working out later in the day, then you may just be physically exhausted from, from your day's work and not having much energy for your workouts. So you might want to try uh, working out earlier in the day or vice versa. If you're already working out early in the day and you don't feel that you have much energy, maybe try working out later in the day and see how that works. I mean, we all have our own individual preferences. Like you talk to some people, some may say, well, I'm a morning person. Some people say I'm a night owl. It's kind of like we have our own individual rhythms of, of when our body tends to be at its peak. So, I mean, if, if you find that you're not functioning at your peak during your regular workout time, try working out at a different time and see if that affects your energy levels. You know, so it, it may help. Uh, just kind of point this out. Some of the most consistent people that I know are early morning workout uh, enthusiasts, people who go to the gym first thing in the morning, uh, you know, before they do their day's work. So before they go to their job or whatever, they go to the gym and get their workout done. And then that's done and out of the way first thing before life starts throwing stuff at you, before you have the challenges of work and before you have family responsibilities and all this other stuff that's just going to kind of bog you down and drain your energy mentally and physically, you can kind of get that workout done and out of the way. So just a little side note, some people find that it's easier to be consistent if you start your day with your workout. And uh, so something you might want to consider. We have uh, Boyasin joining us. And he says, I have knee pain on my left leg when squatting. What are some fixes for that? Love your videos. Thanks. Well, glad you enjoy the videos. Uh, knee pain on the left leg when squatting. Well, first off, you could temporarily lay off squatting if that is causing the direct knee pain and try some other exercise variations instead. Uh, if you want to try and continue squatting, I would recommend looking for different variations, meaning vary the width of your stance. You could try uh, elevating your heels if you're not already. You could try the direction that you point your toes, like maybe having your toes pointed slightly outwards would help. Uh, you know, there's a lot of different things you can play around with. Uh, you could also try like maybe a hack squat variation or uh, even doing a Smith machine squat variation. And the thing that I like about uh, the, the Smith machine is if if you want to change the, the way that your legs get worked when you squat, you could put your feet further forwards as you squat. And by doing so, it's going to take some of the strain off the knees and place a little bit more of the emphasis on the, the glutes and the hamstrings. So that might help as well. Uh, if, if you want to just lay off squats entirely, you could try doing leg presses as your main compound exercise for legs. And again, a little tip that you can use when doing leg presses is to place your feet high and wide on the leg press foot plate. The higher and the wider you go, the less emphasis it's going to place on the knees and again more of the emphasis on the glutes and hamstrings. I mean you're still going to be working the knees don't get me wrong I mean you're still working the knees still working the quads but you're just taking some of the, the emphasis off those areas and transferring it to the larger uh, joint of the hips so that it may make the exercise more comfortable to perform. Uh, another thing that you can try doing as well is um, with your leg workouts warm up beforehand with really lightweight leg extensions. So go over to the leg extension machine, just choose very lightweight, like 10 or 20 pounds on the weight stack and perform high repetitions. Even shoot for like 100 total reps. So I mean, rep out as many reps as you can until you get the lactic acid burn in your legs, 
rest for 10 or 20 seconds and do another set of as many reps as you can rest 10 or 20 seconds and just keep going in that fashion until you grind out a hundred total reps i know it sounds like a lot uh, but you're using very light weight and it's actually very therapeutic on the knees just that high repetition that movement and the lactic acid burn that you get from doing so is actually very therapeutic on the joints and i've personally recovered old knee injuries by using high rep leg extensions. And in fact, what I would do is I would perform that every single workout, regardless if it was a leg day or not. First thing I do, I go into the gym, do my, my warm up routine, and I included the high rep leg extensions as part of my total body warm up before working out. And I found that that was uh, very therapeutic on the knees, just that movement, the blood flow, and again, lactic acid burn. Lactic acid is actually very therapeutic for healing up joint pain and, and injuries. So that's why a lot of times when people have uh, joint problems, they recommend doing lighter weight for higher reps because you get that lactic acid burn and uh, it places less strain on the actual joint, but it can actually be therapeutic to help heal that joint. So those are a few tips that you can try using uh, to work around that knee pain issue. Okay, what other questions have we got here? I see. Okay, Mandeep is joining us and he says, what protein brand do you recommend? I'm presently using ProStar from Ultimate Nutrition. Uh, I like to vary my protein powders. And <laughs> I tell you where I've been getting my protein from recently, and I get it from Costco. <laughs> Costco has not a huge selection of protein powder, but what they do have is priced very well and it, it meets my needs. <laughs> so I, lately what I've been using is Optimum Nutrition, uh, their whey protein, Optimum Whey from Costco. They've carried that recently. And that's what I've been using as my most recent protein powder of choice. Uh, but I will vary the brands of protein powder from time to time. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm not, you know, uh, stuck on one particular brand. I mean, if, if a particular protein powder is on sale, hey, I'll try that one as long as it meets the needs. I mean, I'll go through the, the label and read the actual nutrition label, read the ingredients, and I'll base my decision off that. I'm not really stuck to a particular brand because quite honestly, most of the major brands of protein powder out there, they're all buying the raw materials from the same manufacturers and just getting it branded and packaged as their own. So, I mean, they're getting the same raw material whey protein as all the other manufacturers are. They're just putting in their own flavors and additives and whatever else and then packaging it as their own individual product. But a lot of times the quality of the actual protein that you get from, you know, brand X is probably the same protein or same quality protein that you would get from brand Y. So, again, I'm not a big... Uh, big advocate of, of particular brands I'll, I'll mix it up and try different brands and different flavors and stuff like that so um, just like I say the one that i'm currently using is an optimum nutrition way and i'm getting that from costco i mean they got these big bags of it and they're selling it cheap and it's literally it's cheapest protein around so that's where i'm buying my protein from okay we have t hair t t her <laughs> T. Her is joining us and he says, hello, Lee, I have a very bad case of tennis elbow. What should I do for it? This can be a, a, a nuisance injury. I've dealt with tennis elbow on and off my whole life. Now, thankfully, it's I've been keeping it under control and haven't had much in the way of a flare up recently. Uh, but I've had one of my coaching students, <clears throat> excuse me, he's a, he's a regular on the Total Fitness Bodybuilding Inner Circle. Uh, he, he's been dealing with tennis elbow for years. So I've, I've really gotten a few tips and suggestions from him. And one of the things that he's done recently that's made a world of difference is he got himself a set of lifting hooks. Uh, you're probably familiar with lifting straps that you use to, to reinforce your grip uh, when you're doing like rowing exercises. But he went and got a set of hooks, which work very similar to straps, except you don't actually strap yourself to the bar what you're using is it's a strap that goes on your wrist and it's a, a metal hook and you just literally hook the, the metal hook around the barbell. So you don't need to engage your grip at all when you're doing your, your rowing and pulling exercises. And that has made a huge difference uh, for this particular individual is using the, the hooks because one of the, the causes or the, the 
once you have tennis elbow, one of the things that causes it to get more inflamed and to be more aggravated is doing a lot of gripping exercises, repetitive gripping. So gripping the barbells, gripping the dumbbells and things like that, gripping the machine handles, all that gripping places a lot of strain on that tennis elbow area. So if you can avoid overstraining your grip and kind of let that those muscles and the tendons and ligaments recover, then you'll speed up the healing in that tennis elbow. Because one of the problems with it, if, if you're constantly doing gripping exercises with your workouts, you're, you're breaking down that the inflamed tendons and ligaments and you're never giving them a chance to recover. So you need to, first off, stop doing more damage to the area and give it a chance to recover. So the, the lifting hooks is a great strategy because it can minimize some of the gripping that you have to do with your workouts. You can still go through the motions and train, uh, but again, it's not placing nearly as much strain on the tendons and ligaments, and it'll allow that tennis elbow to heal up. Uh, there, there's some other rehab exercises that you can do, and I've posted some YouTube videos covering those rehab exercises. So if, if you want, you can just do a search for Lee Hayward Tennis Elbow. And if you do a search for that on YouTube, you will get my video exercises for uh, suggestions on things that you can do to help rehab it. But that strategy of using the lifting hooks will be a, be a good one because it'll help to prevent you from causing further strain and damage to the areas that are already inflamed. Okay, next one, Raiders asking, how many sets per body part do you think is ideal? Uh, th th again, this is a very generic question and I can't give an ideal number because it varies individual to individual. I mean, the volume of sets that you can handle is going to vary depending on your own work capacity, your own fitness level, and what it is that you're training for. So, I mean, someone who's just starting out is obviously going to handle much fewer sets than someone who's been training for 10 years, right? So, I mean, I can't give a, 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 a one-size-fits-all answer because there is no one-size-fits-all answer. But what I will kind of give you some guidelines that you can follow is when you're planning out your workouts and, and your sets, what you need to look at is your total training volume for the week. Uh, some people like to structure their workouts in a way where they're training like each body part once a week. And in those workouts, they'll probably do a lot of sets because they're only hitting that body part once a week. Uh, some other people may like to do uh, more frequent workouts, but fewer sets per workout. So they'll be hitting their body parts, you know, maybe two or three times a week, but they'll be doing much fewer sets during those workouts. But if you look at the big picture, the total volume per the week is probably very similar. So for example, if you're doing like a one body part per week schedule, you may do 20 sets per body part. If you're hitting each body part uh, twice a week, then you may do 10 sets per body part, you know, same total volume for the week. And then if you're breaking that down even further, say like training uh, each body part three times a week, then maybe you'll do like six or seven sets per body part. So you're still getting that average, say like 20 sets over the course of the week. That's what counts the most is your total weekly volume and adjusting that based on your own individual recovery. I mean, if you find that that's too much to recover from and you're not feeling that you're recovering from your workouts and you're constantly feeling bro broken down and delayed soreness and you just feel that you're not making the gains that you should be, then you may need to scale that back even lower. Vice versa, if you're recovering from it fine and you say that, you know, that feels too easy, I can do more, then maybe you need to bump it up and do more. So again, I can't really give you a one size fits all answer because it's it's a very individual thing, the amount of sets that you can handle per body part. All right, we have Tim's joining us. So I just started the gym, been going for a month, wanting to get bigger and jump into a plan. What's the best? Uh, again, a basic beginners, total body workout is what I would recommend. If you've already been doing that for the past month and you feel like you're ready to progress to something a bit more advanced, then I would recommend an upper lower body split. Uh, the way I, I usually recommend workout programs to people, again, this is a, a general guideline because each individual is different, but if you're just starting off, total body workout three days a week, plenty. That's all you need. If you're beyond that, you've been doing that for a couple months and you feel that, you know, I'm, I'm starting to plateau with that basic total body workout, I want to do something a bit more intense, then I would recommend an upper lower body split. Train your upper body one day, lower body the next, take a day off, 
train upper body one day, lower body the next, take a day off and keep repeating like that. Then if you find that that's, that goes stale after, you know, a couple months of following that, then you might want to get into something a bit more advanced, like say like a push pull legs routine where you train your pushing muscles one day, your pulling muscles the next, and then you train your legs and abdominals the following day and, and go through in that rotation. Uh, th that's the general progression that I usually use for most people to build them up from a basic beginner's program to a more advanced uh, bodybuilding split routine type of program. All right, David is joining us. He says, squats kill my knees. Doesn't matter which variation. What's a good alternative? Is leg press sufficient? Uh, it's very similar to a question we just answered, but yes, leg presses are fine. If you find squats are killing your knees and you've tried multiple squat variations, you don't have to squat, right? Uh, I, I've mentioned this with some other exercises. I mean, yes, squats are a great exercise if they work for your body type and if you can do them comfortably, but not everybody can. So if it doesn't fit your body type for whatever reason, do another exercise instead. I mean, you can still do the machine exercises. You know, you can do leg presses, you can do leg extensions, you can do leg curls, you can do lunges and step ups and whatever else. You can do all kinds of other leg exercises and still build big muscular legs without squatting. I mean, there are, you know, several pro bodybuilders out there who have built huge legs without squatting. So, I mean, it's, it's not a requirement, right? You can still, you can still make progress without them. Okay, what else? Azim is joining us. He says, Lee, if you remember, I've had problems in the heels and out of out for several weeks today. Jeez, excuse me. <laughs> Got to catch my breath here. Azim is saying, Lee, if you remember, I've had problems in my heels and I was out for several weeks. Today, my doctor says I can't go to the gym, but I need to wear heel pads or wear shoes with a cushion. Do you think it's fine using them? Uh, custom orthotics, I guess, is what people usually refer to that if you have to have a custom shoe insole for your, your feet. Um, yeah, I mean, if, if that is a case, by all means, use them. I, I'm, my father, for example, he has a pair of custom orthotics that he uses in his, uh, in his footwear and he finds it makes a huge difference. Um, so if that's the case, by all means, do so. Uh, as far as not going to the gym at all, simply because you have issues with your feet, uh, I, I'd probably ask for a second opinion from your doctor on that one because there's a lot of exercises you can do that don't involve your feet. I mean, you can like do seated exercises for your upper body, right? You can do like, just to kind of give you some examples, I mean, you can do a seated shoulder press, chest press, lat pull down, seated rows. I mean, you can do all these upper body exercises that are not going to engage your feet. So if your feet are the problem, Obviously, I could see that affecting your lower body workouts and anything that you're doing standing, but it shouldn't affect what you can do seated. So I, I'm not saying go against your doctor's orders or anything like that. Don't get me wrong. I'm just saying you should probably want to clarify it because simply saying, okay, you have problems with your feet, don't work out at all. You know, what if you suggest, hey, can I still go to the gym and do upper body exercises that, you know, don't involve my feet or don't involve standing? and see what your doctor says to that. Uh, de depending on the type of doctor you have, some are very um, you know, encouraging when it comes to weight training and, and things like that. And some, are, some of the old school doctors are very um, kind of like back in the, the dark ages and they think weight training is bad. You know? So uh, I, I remember one time I went, this is years ago, I actually had an injury with my uh, ankle and I went to the doctor and actually I went to the emergency room because it was like a, a sprained ankle and I didn't know if I had broke it or whatever, but I went to the emergency room and then the emergency room doctor that was on site then at the time, he was a really old school doctor and he, he ex I explained how I worked out with weights and stuff like that. And he's like, what do you do that for? And I said, I work out with weights because I want to build muscle and get in shape and all this. And he says, don't do that. That's not good for you. I'm like, <laughs> Right. I mean, this this is like 20 plus years ago when I did, when I went to this doctor. But still, like some people are, are back in the Stone Ages where they think, you know, weight training is bad for you. But, you know, if you go to like a modern current doctor who keeps up with current research and things like that, then they'll realize, hey, weight training is actually pretty darn good for you. So if, if your doctor is telling you not to weight train, you know, I'd be a bit, bit leery of it. I, I'd want to probably get a second opinion before I scrap working out altogether. 
Okay, what else have we got here? We got Carlos Mendelez, and he's saying, Lee, do you do empty calorie drinks such as diet soda and beer slash wine sometimes convert fat and make you gain weight? This is a touchy subject, but I'm going to dive right into it. I think diet drinks and zero calorie drinks can contribute to weight gain indirectly, not because of the actual calories in the drink, but how it messes with your hormonal response. When you consume sugar or anything that tastes sweet, your body responds and produces insulin to deal with the sugar. It helps to digest it, absorb it, and either you know convert it into energy or convert it to stored body fat, depending on your individual needs at the time. Uh, when you consume empty calorie drinks, your body tastes sweet. You know, even though it's not sugar, it's artificial sugar, your body still tastes it and starts to pre prepare as if it's going to consume sugar. Uh, when you consume food, it doesn't start when the food hits your belly. It actually starts even if you're even thinking about eating food, your body starts to prepare itself mentally. And then once the food touches your taste buds, it stimulates a hormonal response. Like you get the saliva, you know, stirring up in your mouth and it's, it literally starts the whole hormonal process as if you were going to consume that food. For example, if, if I had you over for dinner and I, you know, we were cooking up some food and we had a, you know, you could smell the food. And then I put the plate of food in front of you, you know, we got this big, nice home cooked meal and it smells delicious and everything else. You just sitting there and smelling that food I mean, it's going to start to make your mouth water and it's, it's literally going to start the processes of digestion because you're visualizing that food and everything else. You're smelling that food, you're experiencing it, and your body literally starts the digestion process. It starts preparing itself, starts secreting saliva, it starts uh, secreting insulin, all these hormones and metabolic processes that's going to be required to digest that food that you're anticipating. So when you consume zero calorie drinks, even though they are zero calorie, they taste sweet. So you consume that sweet taste, your, your mouth tastes it, your taste buds and everything else. And that triggers your body to start producing insulin because you need to digest and process the sugar that you're consuming. But the problem is you're not consuming any sugar. So, I mean, the processes get started and then it hits your belly and it's like, there's nothing there. So it can indirectly mess with the way that your metabolic processes work by the, you know, you're tricking your body. You're, you're thinking that it's consuming sugar, but it's not. And over time, I think that this can contribute to weight gain, even though the calories themselves are, are not coming from the drinks. And what very often happens is by drinking cal uh, empty calorie drinks like diet soda and, and artificial juices and things like that, you know, crystal light or, or whatever, uh, it can actually, due to these metabolic processes, increase your appetite. So you'll probably make up for those calories by eating more food elsewhere. Uh, I used to be a kind of like a, a bit of a diet soda addict. I always drank diet soda. Now, I still managed to diet down and compete in bodybuilding competitions and everything else, despite the fact that I was drinking diet soda. I mean, you, if you, you can still make progress, even though you're doing something that's not really helping. <laughs> so I still made gains and made progress, despite the fact that I was drinking diet soda. But I found when I cut that out of my diet, and I've I haven't consumed diet soda now in, I think it was around 2011. I have, I stopped drinking diet soda. So it's, it's, you know, about seven years since I had any diet soda. Uh, since I cut that out, I found that it was much easier to control my appetite and I just feel better in general. Uh, I mean, I, I did notice a big difference and cause I, when I was drinking the diet soda and the zero calorie drinks, I found that it would make me hungrier even though I'm consuming a zero calorie drink, I would feel more hungry and I would unconsciously be making up those calories through eating more food afterwards. So that's my take on it. I mean, uh, you know, if, if you're, if you must have you no know, diet soda and stuff like that, then so be it. But I think you would be better off without it. That's my personal opinion. All right, Azim's got another question. It says, in one of your videos about deadlifts, you said not to use shoes with cushion. Do you think in my case it would be a problem and can I do squats and leg presses as well? All right, the whole idea um, about footwear, proper footwear for squats and deadlifts. 
if everything is normal, meaning, you know, you've got healthy feet, you got healthy knees, healthy joints and all that kind of stuff. Uh, ideally, you would try and squat and deadlift in either solid footwear that doesn't have a cushion because what happens is under a load, that cushion is going to compress and actually take away some of your strength for the lift. Now, if you're a recreational lifter, it's not a big deal. If you're just in there, you know, working out, just keep in shape, have fun, enjoy yourself, it, it really doesn't matter. If you're like a competitive lifter and you're really taking it serious and you want to optimize every little detail, then uh, you're not going to be able to squat as heavy wearing a pair of soft, cushy running shoes as you would if you were squatting in a pair of solid sole shoes or something that had a thin sole, such as like a, you know, like a Chuck Taylor's Converse shoe or a proper squat shoe, something with, you know, a hard, solid sole because it's not going to compress under resistance. Whereas a soft, cushy running shoe with, you know, air pockets or whatever, that's going to compress. And in that compression, it's going to take away some of the, the drive that you have for your squat. So I'm not saying that you can't squat with, with running shoes, but if you want to maximize your squat, uh, you'd probably be better off without them and, and either squatting in proper footwear or, or something similar. Uh, when it comes to the deadlifts, uh, the same principle of the, of the cushion absorbing some of the force does apply, but it also raises your feet. Uh, so a lot of people would like to deadlift and keep their feet as close to the ground as possible. That's why you sometimes see people deadlift barefoot or the, like uh, competitive power lifters will sometimes wear like deadlift slippers uh, or even just a very thin flat sole shoe like a Chuck Taylor Converse type of shoe. And the reason for that is because the lower your feet are to the, to the floor, uh, the less distance you have to pull the barbell. If you're on you know, an inch or more of soft, cushiony insoles, then that's another inch that you have to pull the bar versus if your feet were flat on the floor. And if you know from you know, the way the body works, the, the, the further the distance that you have to pull that barbell, the harder it's going to be. So from a competitive power lifter's point of view, uh, they want to try and do everything they can to make that lift as advantageous as possible so that they can maximize their strength and performance. So that's where the whole issue of the, the footwear comes into play. Now, if, if you have specific issues that prevent you from, uh, you know, squatting or deadlifting with, uh, you know, those uh, with a hard insole footwear, then you can wear, you know, custom orthotic footwear or whatever. I mean, obviously you do make the do with whatever situation you have. But again, that's the whole issue with the footwear and squats and deadlifts. Okie dokie. Willis is joining us and says, what does it mean? What does it mean as mean? So, you know. so what does that mean? Twice as often legs once a week, Tuesday and Friday, prioritize arms. 48 to 72 hours rest. I think this is a question to, replying to one of my previous uh, questions asking what does it mean to train legs once a week and prioritize arms? Uh, simple. If you were going to prioritize your upper body over your lower body, you would do two upper body workouts per week and say one lower body workout per week. So uh, I don't know how to make it any more clear than that. Uh, for, for example, if, if you wanted a schedule, you could do like an upper body workout on Monday, maybe a lower body workout on Wednesday, and then do another upper body workout on Friday <laughs> and then go through it that way. I mean, there's different ways to structure it depending on your, your training split and how often you're going to the gym. But bottom line is you would train your upper body twice as frequently as you would train your legs. And that's a way to prioritize the upper body and to uh, scale back on the volume for your leg training. You could even scale it back even further than that, maybe even just train legs once every two weeks if they were really, uh, you know, ahead of the game in terms of your overall development. But anyway, hopefully that clarifies the question. If not, send me a private message. I'll be happy to answer or clarify any of these questions through a private message. Uh, Carlos has got a question saying, what are alternative exercises to the inner and outer thigh adduction and abduction machines if you don't have those machines at home. You can do similar movements with rubber fitness bands. Uh, you know, they're probably not going to look exactly the same as, as the inner and outer thigh machine, 
but you can rig up a similar movement to work the inner thigh muscles and the outer thigh muscles with rubber fitness bands. And that's what I would recommend for a home gym. Uh, literally, I mean, you can go on YouTube and search for like rubber band inner thigh exercises, rubber band outer thigh exercises, and you'll see all kinds of tutorials explaining that. Uh, I even have one posted up on my YouTube channel showing a, a, a variation using rubber fitness bands. Um, I think if you do a search for Lee Hayward weak hips, I think that's the video that covered it. Again, this video was, was shot, oh, jumps five plus years ago. So I can't remember the exact title, but if you do a search for Lee Hayward weak hips, you should find it. Uh, best four exercises for a full body workout. I don't know if I, I don't know if I would really limit it to just four, but let's 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 try. Uh, I would do some sort of uh, horizontal press for the the chest. I would do some sort of horizontal row. I would do some sort of overhead press. I would do some sort of overhead pull. So that's uh, that's just the upper body, and we got four exercises done right there. And then you would need to do some sort of leg press or squat and then probably even some sort of pull from the floor. So that would be six. If I was going to, I mean, if you wanted to narrow it down to just four, you could say like uh, bench, squat, deadlift, overhead press, right? I mean, those are four good exercises. Uh, but uh, I, I like to look at it even in a greater spectrum than that and look at the movement patterns. So if you want to like do a the most efficient workout with the minimum exercises possible, think of the movement pattern. So you want to do a horizontal press, you want to do a horizontal pull, you want to do an overhead press, overhead pull, and then you also want to do some sort of squat or leg press, as well as some sort of pulling from the floor. And if you did those movement patterns, again, that's six movement patterns, uh, you would basically hit all the major muscles of the body. Okay, what else we got? Another question. So some comments amongst the, the, you know, just just chat back and forth. So I'm not going to focus on that. I'm just going to kind of get the questions that are kind of geared towards me right now. Um, why do I? This is from uh, Giannis. It says, "Why do I feel stronger on a neutral grip chin up than a regular grip chin up?" Uh, I'm not sure what you mean by a neutral grip, unless. But I will kind of cover the different grips of, of chin-ups, pull-ups, etc. Uh, a lot of times you will have some strength fluctuation depending on what kind of grip you do. Uh, a, lot, a lot of people will feel stronger with maybe like a parallel grip or maybe an underhand grip when they're doing pull-ups slash chin-ups. Uh, generally speaking, just to kind of clarify it, a lot of people consider a pull-up when you use an overhand grip and they consider it a chin-up when you use an underhand grip. Uh, but again, there's a lot of different grip variations. So uh, sometimes if you're doing an overhand grip, you may not feel as strong that way. And the reason is, it's because it's not engaging the biceps to such an extent. You're using primarily uh, the, the lats as the major mover, the muscles of your back. Whereas when you do either a parallel grip or an underhand grip, now you're bringing in the biceps as secondary supporting muscles and it often helps uh, with completing the repetition, especially in that top portion of the rep, when you're trying to, as they say, get your chin over the bar. If if you uh, if you're doing an underhand grip, and you can use the biceps to help complete that repetition, uh, that's why you may feel a bit stronger. But that that's totally normal to have strength fluctuations depending on the type of grip you use. What I personally like to do if if I'm doing pull ups and chin ups, is I will start with my weakest grip first. And then as I fatigue, I will gradually switch to my stronger grips for each successing set. So, for example, let's say I was going to do, you know, three sets. I might do uh, one set with an overhand grip. I might do one set with a parallel grip and then do another set with an underhand grip. And I find that it's working through your, your natural strength curve of, you know, the weakest exercise first, then uh, gradually working towards the strongest position at the end. So that's something that you can incorporate. Uh, we have Arnold is joining us. Uh, not Arnold Schwarzenegger, by the way. Arnold Beckenbauer. And he's saying, uh, Lee, I love your videos. I have a question about a strange pressure in the back of my head while training. 
it's so heavy that I have to close my eyes and put pressure on with my hands, both hands. Um, it could be an exertion headache. I, I, I made a video about this a while back, about the, the whole topic of exertion headaches. And um, <clears throat> a, a lot of times when you're training, if you're not breathing fully and properly, you can sometimes have like a, a like temporary oxygen deprivation and it may cause headaches and pain. So one of the things that you can try in doing uh, with your workouts is one, stop your sets short of failure. So don't physically exert yourself quite as hard because when you push your limits and you strain, sorry for the phone ringing, I'll let the wife get that. Yeah, we'll ignore the phone. Uh, when you physically strain and exert yourself under a lot of effort, it can place, you know, uh, you can cause the headaches. So stop your sets a rep or two shy of failure. That's one thing that's going to help. Purposely rest longer between sets. So if you're normally only resting, say, like a minute or so between sets, extend that to two minutes between sets. And during those rest breaks between sets, purposely try and do deep breathing, you know. You know, breathe so that you can hear it. Not just like breathing under your under your breath and this little quiet, shallow breath. Purposely take deep breaths, belly breathing. You know, let your chest and belly expand with each breath. Let it contract as you exhale and do really deep breathing. And by doing that, you're going to get more oxygen throughout your system. And it's going to help to, uh, you know, get more oxygen to your brain and that to minimize the headaches as well. Another thing that you can do is stretching your neck a lot of times we have tight muscles throughout our, our neck and and this can cause nerve impingements which can cause uh, aches and pains all over i mean if you have a nerve impingement in your neck it could cause anything from a headache to aches and pains throughout your arms your shoulders your hands i mean because the way it works is everything all the nerves travel through the neck and through the spine i mean so every all the nerves throughout your entire body you know travel through the neck uh, so if, if you have an impingement in your neck then this can cause aches and pains all over. So neck exercises and stretches, you know, simply just you know, going through some head and neck rotations. I mean, you can do these throughout the day. You don't necessarily have to do them at the gym, but even throughout the day as well. And then side to side. And then ear to shoulder. And do those, do them frequently, like do say 10 or 20 rotations of each and really take your time and feel each side of your neck stretching as you're doing that. And that's really good for loosening up the muscles of your neck and increasing circulation. So that'll help to uh, minimize some of those uh, headaches. Uh, another thing, make sure that you stay well hydrated. Dehydration is a prime source of getting headaches. So keep yourself hydrated. Uh, throughout your workouts, sip water in between sets. I mean, don't, don't drink a lot at any one time, but just take little sips frequently throughout your workouts, and that will help to keep you hydrated. Uh, and again, there's another step that you can take to help minimize headaches. But uh, if you want more information about it, just do a search for Lee Hayward exertion headache. I mean, it covers a lot of the same stuff that I just did here, but you know, I'm, I probably expand on it a bit more in that video than what I did here. Okay, let's see what else we've got. Uh, Zeem's asking, Lee, you made a warm-up uh, routine video, which my favorite, which was my favorite fitness video ever. Please make a stretching routine video as well. Uh, again, I do have some older stretching routine videos. There's a full playlist on YouTube that you can refer to now, but that's something that I can definitely make a, a new updated one. And that's one of the things that I'm going to really focus on in the future now with my videos is I'm going to go back over a lot of the older videos that I made. I'm not saying that the content wasn't good, but reshoot them, reshoot them with a better quality camera, better quality audio, and just kind of put a new spin on it for, for a new video. Because I have some videos there, some of my most popular videos are like 10 years old. And, right, I mean, so I want to get... Uh, basically just put a fresh spin on some of the stuff. So again, if you go back through my channel, there's a lot of stuff there. I mean, some of it good, some of it maybe not so good, but uh, I, I do have a stretching series. And again, that stretching series is at least five years or more <laughs> is when I made that five years ago, at least. But uh, you can refer to that in the meantime. So just go to the playlist section on the Total Fitness Bodybuilding YouTube channel and look for the bodybuilding stretching routine. 
and I have stretches there for all the major muscles. So there's back stretching routine, leg stretching, chest stretching, shoulder, arms, uh, specific hip mobility stretching. So I have everything there in a whole playlist that you can refer to. Okay. Okay, let's see. And Niam is asking, saying, I don't like doing cardio as my appetite goes through the roof. Would it be okay to cut food intake? I'm currently having 1,400 to 1,500 calories. How low shall I cut my calories before I burn muscle? That's, again, a very individual question, but I'm going to suggest something else. I would rather you eat more and burn more rather than eat less and burn less. Uh, the, our metabolism is very unique. It's not like a machine. It's not like, a, you know, you put X number of calories in and you burn X number of calories out. Our metabolism is constantly fluctuating. It's a lot more complex than most people realize. Uh, if you eat less, your metabolism slows down. If you eat more, your metabolism speeds up. So it, it's not as simple as just calories in versus calories out. But a good general guideline that I would recommend, eat more and burn more. And I'm going to steal a phrase from uh, Tom Venuto, who's a you know a fitness guy, been online for, for several years. But, but he created a program called Burn the Fat, Feed the Muscle. And that's a good mentality to have when it comes to your uh, bodybuilding workouts, especially when it comes to fat loss. You want to burn the fat, burn the fat through exercise and feed the muscle through quality nutrition. Don't think about starving the fat through cutting back your food intake. Because what happens when you cut back your food intake is you also increase your risk of, of losing muscle and slowing down your metabolism in the process. So I would much rather you eat more and burn more and make progress that way. And to kind of put things in perspective, if you look at a lot of uh, top level competitive bodybuilders, I mean, they eat a heck of a lot of food even while they're dieting for competition. Now, granted, it's all relative to their size and their energy output and everything else, but they very rarely take the the, the mindset of trying, trying to starve away the fat. They usually eat more and burn more and just trying to keep that metabolism racing. You know, by eating more quality food, their metabolism speeds up, their metabolic hormones speed up, uh, they increase or even maintain their lean muscle mass, uh, and they can burn the calories through more intense workouts and then extra cardio sessions as well. So eat more, burn more, rather than trying to starve away the fat. That's what I would recommend. All right, guys, I'm going to get ready and clue it up because I know we've gone over an hour here now. I don't know exactly... Where's, where's the time? I, I, I don't know if I have a clock here on my thing here saying how long I've been, but I'm sure it's been over an hour. And I know my wife has dinner ready. I can hear her out there cooking dinner now. So I, I want to get out there and enjoy some dinner with my wife and kid. So I'm going to get ready and clue up our video chat. Thanks again for tuning in. Thanks for your questions. I really appreciate your support. And as always, what I'm going to do is I will post the replay of this video chat up on the Total Fitness Bodybuilding YouTube channel, and I'm going to have timestamps for all the individual questions. So if you would like to go back and review this and just focus on the specific questions that are of interest to you, you can do so. And I try and do that with all my live video chats. So if you want to go back over any of the past video chats as well, open up the video description and there will be timestamps in there. So you can pick and choose what questions are the most interesting to you. So again, thanks for tuning in. I really appreciate it. Have yourself a fantastic weekend. And I will talk to you again next Friday for another live video chat. Take care. Over and out.